My name is Sandra Peter and I am the director of Sydney Business Insights at the University of Sydney Business School. And before we begin our event, as always, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and country. Um, today I'm coming to you from Brisbane, uh, which is called Mianjin by the traditional custodians of country here, um, the Turbal and the Yagara people. The University of Sydney has many campuses built on Aboriginal country and many of us on this Zoom today are living on land with which the first people of Australia have a connection going back millennia. And since we're talking about big projects um, today, I think it's really worth reflecting on the, a remarkable and really successful project of having over 60,000 years of continuing connection to this uh, country. So as we share our um, knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of this country. Uh, I am delighted to introduce Professor Ben Flubier to, to our audience. Professor Flubier is the BT is the first BT professor um, at Oxford University and the VKR professor at the IT University of Copenhagen. He's consulted on over 100 um, uh, projects costing over a billion dollars and has been knighted by the Queen of Denmark. And um, Nobel Prize winning author Danny Kahneman calls his, uh, and Danny's been a guest on our, on our previous webinar, on a few of our previous webinars, but um, Danny uh, uh, calls his work important, timely, instructive and entertaining. He's not only an economic geographer, but he's probably best known as the world's leading mega project uh, expert. Uh, that's according to, to KPMG. And his latest book uh, is written with Dan Gardner is How Big Things Get Done, uh, which Bent has very generously agreed to discuss with us today. He's joining us from Oxford. So we all very much appreciate that you've stayed up so late to engage with us um, in this discussion. Thank you so much. Um, as we get started, just want to remind everyone watching that you can submit your questions still on Slido using the event code, how big things get done. Um, many questions on Slido already, uh, but before we get going, um, let me welcome Bent again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for your generous introduction and, and, and thank you to everybody for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. A um, few hundred people joining us today. Really, really nice. Uh, so let me start by asking a couple of questions before we, we will take quite a few of the audience questions. But Ben, I think the kind of best place to start is with a landmark that uh, will be familiar to many people um, um, on the webinar today. And it's an example that you very often um, talk about, and that's the Sydney Opera House. This is a spectacular landmark, much loved by, by all of us and well recognized um, around the world. So since we're hosting this from the University of Sydney, um, famous um, Danish designed opera house. Let me start with your views on what we can all learn about better project management from the story of the Sydney Opera House. But first, let me start by saying that it's one of my favorite buildings uh, in the world, probably the Sydney Opera House and uh, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. They are my two favorite buildings. And I, I don't think I'm alone in this. There's general consent that they might be the two greatest buildings of the last uh, 100 years. So. So that's really something. And um, um, yeah, it's just a magnificent building. I've been there several times and I always feel uplifted, you know, and I think this is uh, what great art does, you know, no matter what kind of art, it lifts you up. And the uh, Sydney Opera House certainly lifts me up when I visit it. And uh, I know many other people have the same experience. Uh, but, you know, it's really a story made for a great tragedy, what happened with the Sydney Opera House, unfortunately. I mean, maybe many people um, don't know this or have forgotten this and so on, but it, it was a, a disaster, you know, in, in terms of execution and in terms of the career of the architect, which was destroyed, you know, you know. Name me another building uh, that the architect has made. Uh, so. Uh, 
And, you know, there is no other major building by this architect. And to me, uh, that's the I mean, main that's thing. That's Joran Utzon, who's... Uh, Joran Utzon, yeah. So, he was fairly young you know, when he did this. Yeah, he was 36 when he won the competition. And that's very young for an architect. Uh, and I've talked to more than a thousand people, probably a couple of thousand people about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Sydney Opera House and asked them the question, do you know who the architect is? And the vast majority of people, I mean, very, very few people know who the architect is. And even if they know, you know, then I ask, okay, second question, uh, can you name me another building by that architect? And of course, nobody can because there are no other buildings, except, you know, the, the connoisseurs know there are a few small buildings in uh, Denmark and uh, and also uh, an assembly in Kuwait. And, uh, but this is the main thing to learn, you know, is that you can't build things so that you destroy the careers of the architects. That's not okay, you know, to be so inconsiderate in the way you do things. So we need to have better project implementation than that. And um, one mm -hmm. thing to learn from uh, the Sydney Opera House is you can't take 14, 16 years to do a project. It's just way too long. Uh, that's one thing regarding time, you know, that uh, you need to keep it short when you're doing projects. If you want to do something that's successful, it has to be short. Uh, another thing is that you can't start until you know what you're doing, which is what they did with the Sydney Opera House, that they, uh, they actually had to dynamite out parts of the Opera House, uh, you know, while they were building it because they built the wrong thing because they didn't have the final drawings when they started doing the building. Not a good idea to start building before you know what you're building obviously so that's another thing you know that you need to and we talk about this in the book we call it think slow act fast but the sydney opera house they did the exact opposite they thought fast they really got uh, they got going very very quickly uh, because this was a mandate from the government that you have to start building now because they were afraid that the decision might be overturned to build the opera house by a new government. So they wanted to build as much as possible, as quickly as possible to get to a point of no return, which is quite uh, common, but it's a really bad idea. Uh, and uh, so they built, they, they thought uh, fast and then they were forced to uh, act slow because so many problems occurred uh, during uh, construction. And I think we have to be really grateful that the part that the, that the Jörn Utzon, the Danish architect, got to do was the outside. So he actually didn't do the inside because he left the project in the middle of the project. He was forced out. Uh, the New South Wales government simply stopped paying his salary, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he went that's back. That's one to way Denmark. to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to fire somebody. So, uh, so uh, he went back to Denmark, but before he went back, he had actually overseen the design of the shells and putting the shells up. I remember the first time I came to the opera house, I was shocked to walk from the outside to the inside. The inside looked like a 1970s discotheque, you know, and obviously <laughs> that wasn't designed by Jörn Utzon. That was designed by some architect, some local architect that took over after he left. And basically that architect destroyed his career by taking over this project by Jörn Utzon. So and other architect's career was destroyed by the Sydney Opera House because of the mismanagement of the project. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that we have this wonderful building, uh, obviously, as anybody should be, but boy, could that have been done differently and much better. But you've you've built one of the biggest databases in terms of uh, mega projects. You've, you've mentioned two very famous ones here, the um, Opera House and um, the Guggenheim Museum. But much of your research has explored these mega projects. I mean, 16,000 mega projects. And this is this is informed the things get done. You all talk all of mega projects. Can you tell us what the iron law is and how does it play out in the kinds of projects that this, you discuss in the book? Yep. So first, it's not 16,000 mega projects. It's 16,000 projects of which most of them are quite large projects. But in order to understand whether the size actually makes a difference uh, to the outcome of projects, we need to study both small, medium size and large projects. So we have all sizes in, in the database. Um, the iron law, uh, is very simple. It says over budgets, over time, under benefits, over and over again. So over budget, over time, under benefits, over and over again. That's the iron law. And uh, 
it's a statistical law and it, it holds with a very high uh, level of statistical significance, actually unusually high for human behavior. And it means that if you if you are planning on building a project, then you have a very, very high likelihood. The odds are that you will be over budget, that you, you will be over scheduled. So you'll you'll have to spend more money than you thought, you will take longer than you thought, and you won't deliver the benefits that you thought. That's just the odds. It's like going to a casino. These are the, your base rates, you know, and, and uh, it's really important to face up to that, especially if you want to change it. Then you know you need to know it's like if you go. If you play cards, if you're a poker player, you need to know what the odds are if you want to have a chance of winning, right? It's exactly the same here. You need to know that the odds are actually against you, like in any game you're playing in order to win it at the game of building big projects. And if you don't understand this, you don't have a chance. You're like a, you're like a babe in the woods and the wolves will take you. Well, it's a bit like in poker as well. Everyone thinks, yeah, yeah, that's true, but it won't apply to me. I'm the lucky one, the one who will have the lucky winning hand at poker and so on. <laughs> the professional poker players don't think like that, but you're right, the rookies do. Um, so what, factor con what factors contribute to, to this iron law? What makes the iron law? So it depends on what level you look at it. But we, we, in the book, we look at it at what we call root causes. So we, we're trying to find the most fundamental causes of this. And at the root cause level, we find two types of causes. One, are, one is psychology and the other is power. And uh, on the side of psychology, it's cognitive biases. And, and uh, you, you, you just mentioned that you had uh, Danny Kahneman as a guest, so, so he's the preeminent scholar on cognitive bias, optimism bias, anchoring, overconfidence bias, uh, availability bias, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of uh, cognitive biases that are very well documented. And uh, for instance, optimism bias is one of the most pervasive biases and a bias that most people know and understand that we are optimistic about things. So if you're optimistic about the budget on a project, you think it's going to cost less than it actually costs, right? That's optimism. You think it's going to be cheaper. If that's, if that's uh, the way you dealt with, you, you planned the project and developed the business case, then just like the law of gravity, your optimism is con going to boomerang, boomerang around and hit you as a cost overrun, right? If you were optimistic about the budget, you're going to have a cost overrun. Same with the schedule. If you were optimistic about the schedule, you're going to have a schedule overrun. Same with benefits. If you were optimistic about the benefits, you're going to have benefits underrun. So you're going to under deliver on your benefits. So that's how optimism and other cognitive biases as root causes influence what is happening on projects. That's the psychology side. The power side, we have what we call strategic misrepresentation. And on the power side, things are deliberate. So the psychology side, things are not deliberate. People don't do that consciously. So we are not optimistic consciously. Actually, deliberate optimism is an oxymoron. You know, mm -hmm. if it's deliberate, if you if you are deliberately optimistic, it's not optimism. Then it's something else. It's probably strategic misrepresentation. And strategic misrepresentation is like you you lowball the project in order to make it look good on paper. So if you deliberately, politically, you decide I'm going to make my project look good on paper. How do you do that? Well, that's easy. Anybody can do it. You know, you 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 lower the cost, you lowball the cost, as the Americans call it, and you lowball the schedule and you overestimate the benefits. Then you look really pretty on paper, and you have a good chance if you are if you are evaluated, uh, assessed against other projects, that your product is going to come out on top, because you falsely uh, misrepresented the the cost, the schedule, and the benefits, and. Um, Strategic misrepresentation power actually works like psychology. The di ma main difference is that one is unconscious and the other is conscious, but they both contribute to uh, uh, like for cost, a cost underestimation, and then as a consequence, cost overrun. And the same with, the, with time and, and benefits. So that, that those are uh, the explanations at the root cause level. Those are the two main root causes. Of course, if you look at it as sort of the, the more superficial level, You'll hear people say, well, we had cost overrun because, because you know, the weather was bad when we were on the construction site, so we had to take time off. Or 
when we started digging, we found things in the ground where, that we hadn't expected, you know, and, and uh, because we found those things, the project took longer. We found, for, for instance, an archeological uh, find, you know, so we had to stop the project for some time and then do the archeological dig, like the law says we must and so on. And uh, that's also true, you know, these things happen for sure. Or, you know, the price of steel went up. So the price of the project went up. We don't think that these are root causes because if you think about it, we dig in the ground all the time. And if you keep underestimating what you find in the ground, that's actually optimism. You were optimistic about what you were going to find in the ground, or rather you were optimistic that you weren't going to have as, ma as many problems as you actually encountered, right? That's optimism. That's not because, that's not because uh, the, the geology or whatever uh, uh, tripped you up. You tripped yourself up. That's why we say your biggest risk is you. That's one of the sayings in, in the book and one of the, what we call heuristics. And this is a good example of that, that it's actually not the objective risks out there that is the problem. It's our interpretation of risks. And because of our cognitive biases, we misinterpret risk all the time, um, like easily illustrated with optimism, like I just did. So psychology and power as, as the root causes, but I, I do also want to take you to, to explore ex to some of the things that lead to success um, in, in project Sounds management. Good. But before I take you that, uh, I want to hear a bit about projects that, that were successful. And one of the most interesting examples uh, in, in, in your book is the Empire State Building. And I mean, just the numbers to me are, are staggering. This was completed 17% under budget, right on schedule. The whole thing from kind of design to delivery in under two years, that for, for, and for many of us from Sydney, that, that just seems completely impossible to, to, to do today. Um, tell us a bit about what made the Empire State Building and what, why was it so successful? Yeah, I'm glad that you are, you are asking about success because actually we, we really made a point of including a lot of success stories in the book because I was getting tired of being, you know, because there are so many projects that have gone bad and you study projects, then all, all of a sudden I began to get the reputation that, hey, He's, he's the scholar of doom, you know, on projects. And that's, that's not fair. And, and that's not what I want to do. I actually think the successes, of course, are at least, and I would say more important than the failures. Uh, and the Empire State Building is a great example. And it shows us that we have been able to do this, you know, always. We can actually do successful projects. And we were able to do it 100 years ago. We were able to do it 200 years ago. And we are able to do it today. So it's not like we don't know how to do successful projects. It's just that we don't do it. And that's very interesting. Why don't we do it when, when I mean, some people know how to do it. The Empire State Building was as successful as it was because the people who built it really knew what they were doing. Really, really good people. And they, they were thinking slow, not in the sense that they were taking years to think out how to build the project. They actually thought it out within one year. But they... Uh, they uh, used that time really well. And it was a long time compared to the construction period. So, so they, it, it took them one and a half years to build the building and it took them a little less than a year to design the building. So they used a fair amount of time uh, in order to get it right. And this is the right way to do it. And they did that. Not only that, they had actually already built a smaller skyscraper, exact design, almost exactly like the, like the Empire State Building. Not a lot of people know this, but they, they built for the Reynolds Company. So this, is, this uh, was a famous tobacco company in the US, and they built a headquarters in another town. And, uh, and it was designed pretty much like the Empire State Building. So the, the architect and the, and the builders had already built one skyscraper like this. Now they just had to do it one more time and, and taller. So they had experience. That's another thing we emphasize in the book. You need experience. Also, they, they used a modular design. They had completely designed uh, uh, the building uh, from top to bottom. And they did it in a way where the majority of floors were exactly like other floors. So they actually said, you know, to uh, illustrate what they were doing, we actually did not build a skyscraper. We just built the same floor a hundred plus times and then we stacked them on top of each other. That's why the building is so tall. We did not build a skyscraper. We built one floor many times. So that would mean that they just get better and faster every time they build it again. As, exactly. As they... This is, 
This is why we emphasize replication in the book. You need to do things in a way where you replicate something over and over, because when you do that, you get what we call positive learning curves. It means that you get better and better. You get faster and you get cheaper at what we are doing. And that's exactly what happened on the Empire State Building. They actually built you know, uh, more than one floor a week uh, uh, and uh, as, as, you know, substantially more when they really hit their stride. So in the beginning, it was a bit slower, but then they got better and better as they replicated these floors. And they, and they, they, they got up to a level of where they were building several floors per week, and then they tapered off again towards the top. So Empire State Building, really great success story. One of the other really interesting examples in your book is Heathrow uh, Airport's Terminal 5. And I'm, I think everyone's kind of familiar with what disasters airport projects normally normally are. They're, they're very complex, they're very difficult to deliver. And you might expect from something like Heathrow to, to for this to be a, a complete disaster. Um, however, this wasn't really the case with, with Terminal 5. And you know that that was quite a successful project, and I think since um, Sydney is uh, currently, you know, planning to to build its second long overdue airport, it's worth having a conversation about um, Heathrow's uh, Terminal Five. What what made that successful? So um, basically, the owner, which was BAA uh, at the time, that owned the airport and other airports in the UK, decided that. Uh, we can't build an airport the way airports are normally built. The first thing they did actually, again, using thinking slow, act fast, during their thinking slow period, they went out and studied other airports. And they came to the conclusion after having studied other airports that if they built this airport the way other airports are built, they were going to go 1 billion pounds over budget and they were going to go like one and a half years over schedule or whatever. That's not the exact number, but something like that. And uh, and they decided we're not going to do that for a very simple reason. We can't afford it. You know, our company will go bankrupt if we do it like that. Uh, so we need to find another way. And the other way was uh, for BAA to take on the risk of building a Terminal 5. So instead of trying, as you usually do, writing contracts where the risk is allocated to the builders, they said, no, we're not going to do that. We are going to use a partnership model where we as the owner we keep the risk and then we are partnering with the builders and uh, with just one goal and that is to deliver this airport to the budgets and to the schedule and to the high quality that we have stipulated in the design and uh, they succeeded in this and and what they got from their partnering model was that they avoided all the conflicts that you typically find on a construction site where immediately i mean not you Sometimes even before you've even started construction, people are suing each other. You know, no, no, this is not my risk. This is your risk. Because if I have to take the risk, then, you know, that's going to cost me money. And I don't want that because I want to make money on this project. So this is actually your risk. And, 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 and then the other party says, no, 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 it's your risk. And then you have a conflict immediately and you need mediation as a minimum. And sometimes it actually uh, turns into real uh, uh, full out conflict. It's very common. That's why you know people often talk about the, the the construction industry as a very antagonistic industry where people are suing each other right and left, you know, because they are really afraid of uh, uh, the cost of all the risks that they are taking on for good reason because these risks can kill you. So that's that's the if I, if I have to point out just one thing, that's the main thing. But there are lots of other things, you know, like a real. Uh, there was a real team building spirit on the on the on the in the leadership and and the whole team in, in actually actually from the top to the floor in the whole organization uh, everybody felt like a team and this is something that the leadership did everything to cultivate uh, to get take good care of the people who worked on the site to make sure that things were safe and so on uh, so yeah, they just uh, they just did the right things because they were very experienced they had tried this before and they, they knew what it takes. I think you described that, uh, I think it was in your book about, you know, make make friends and, and keep them friendly, which is not something that readily comes to mind when you um, when you think really big projects and especially construction industry is not not something where, where people normally make friends and keep them friendly. Um, yeah, exactly. 
you've uh, you've mentioned a number of times, and before we go to, um, I'll move to audience questions very shortly. But um, before we get there, uh, you mentioned a few times the um, think slow, act fast, and I wanna I wanna uh, I want you to reflect a little bit of, of on that because you you often return to this um, example from from Pixar uh, in in your book. Um, can you talk a bit about their kind of planning process and what the type of work that goes into their projects from where the kind of think fast, act slow, act slow comes from. Sure. Um, yeah, Pixar captured my attention because, well, they're great movies, but also because they have done 20 plus blockbusters in a row. So they only do films that are extremely, not just successful, but extremely successful by Hollywood standards. And that and hasn't been so, replicated by anyone else, really. No, this this is something I knew. I mean, if you read film history and so on, or just the news, actually, and I lived in Los Angeles, so, so uh, and everybody talks about the film industry there. I actually went to UCLA as a student, and, uh, and uh, therefore, this is just a habit, you know, following in the film industry a little bit, and, and I knew that uh, that Film is like hit and miss, you know, you, you win some, you lose some, and nobody ever knows beforehand. It's one of the most difficult things to forecast. So all of a sudden, after 100 plus years of Hollywood history, this studio pops up and they're able to do it again and again and again and again and again, and they just keep doing it, right? What, how did that happen? Uh, so I got very curious about this and luckily, uh, the, the people at Pixar were willing to speak, you know, also I read, uh, Ed Catmull has written an excellent book, by the way, it's called uh, Creativity Incorporated, Creativity Inc, that I recommend. Uh, but uh, Ed Catmull also, he, he actually uh, lectured here at, at Oxford and, uh, and we interviewed him for a long time for the book and the same with Pete Doctor, who's the creative director at, uh, at Pixar. We got to pick their brains. And what we found was that they, they, they're very, very keen on this, this iteration that we talked about before, like the Empire State Building, you know, they build the floor over and over and they do it actually before they build it in reality. So they simulate it. Pixar has a process by which they go through eight iterations of a film before they actually start shooting it. So anybody at Pixar who's a, who's a director can come up with a, an idea for a film. And Pete Doctor explained that often it's just, it's just an idea, like he says, he gets his ideas in the shower. Uh, and uh, so it might just be like a girl who lives in her head, you know. Old that, grumpy that, guy. <laughs> yeah, old grumpy guy, a rat that cooks, you know, a rat that cooks, that sounds crazy. So it's just an idea like that. That's how a film starts. And then the person who has that idea uh, you know, might decide to sit down and write about 10 pages, plus minus a couple, about uh, how would you unfold this idea in a synopsis of what a film could be like. That's the first step. And then you circulate that synopsis to the other directors at Pixar, uh, and you get feedback, and people will say, I like this, I don't like this. That feedback is not something that the director who got the idea has to follow. It's a, it's a, an option. So this is all opportunity for the director. You know, you get all this feedback, you can use it if you want, you don't have to, if you don't want, you just continue. And then you do a third version and you do a fourth version. And then around that time you start doing storyboards. So you, you, you start uh, making images and you, 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 uh, you, you write storyboards and it's all a physical thing. And First, only a, a few, you know, maybe some a dozen or a few dozen, and then eventually the storyboards develop into, you know, three thousand plus storyboards for a typical film, and and they start they start taking pictures of the storyboards, you know, maybe just with your phone, you know, take pictures, and then you can actually run the pictures after each other, and you get an idea of what will this look like when it becomes a film. You can add some, you know, you 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 think what kind of music would be nice behind this. You add the music and you. You try to add some voiceover, just yourselves, you know, just saying the whatever the dialogue is, you put it in there. And eventually going through these eight iterations, you get a more and more complete version of the film. And only when you have that complete version that you are satisfied with, you've had all this feedback. Every round you get feedback. 
So you've had these seven, eight rounds of feedback and you've incorporated whatever you thought was right to incorporate and so on. And now you have a version that you really believe in. That's probably two years in. So this is the thinking slow phase at Pixar is about two years. And then they start shooting and that's the acting fast. And only then do they start shooting uh, with the, which is on, on uh, these expensive animation computers that they have. And uh, they hire in the famous Hollywood actors who are doing the voiceovers for the final version of the film. And they hire in the expensive composers who are composing the music for the film and so on. But only in this phase, because this phase is very expensive. Once you start shooting, it's really expensive. But all the plan, all years, still, maybe a couple of years with those iterations until you bring in the real actors yeah, and the computer exactly. animation. And then, stuff. then, really costs and the then, big then you shoot the film in a, a relatively short period of time. But because of all the preparation you did, you can do it in that short period of time. And the preparation is dirt cheap. It's not cheap, but it's really cheap compared to the actual shooting. And that's why you want the cost to be on that side and not on the shooting side. So think slow, act fast, and also a yeah. fantastic nod to, to Danny Kahneman's work there. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So his, his book is all about thinking fast and the kind of uh, problems that get us into. And we should think slow instead. So we are taking the think slow part and saying, that's what you need to do. Don't think fast, think slow. But Danny is talking mostly about thinking. So we also talk about action. So that's why we put this second part on acting. And, it's really important to see the relationship between the two. And we see it as the rhythm, you know, think slow, act fast. That's the rhythm of a successful project. That's what we see at Pixar. That's what we saw at the Empire State Building. That's what we see in the many other successes that we include in the book. Well, I think this is a, a perfect moment to, to start going to audience questions. Um, we really always want to bring the community along, so I want to make sure we have enough um, time for that. Quick reminder to the audience that you can, still can submit the questions, and they're on slido.com using the event code, how big things get done. But our first question um, comes from Professor Percy Allen from the Institute for uh, Public Policy and Governance at uh, UTS across the road. Um, and the question is, are large public sector projects more prone to failure than large private sector ones? Also, are there, um, are the key reasons for failure in each different or the same? And there's a related question to that that I might bring up as well, um, which asks, having looked at so many different projects, which are the best and which are the worst for on time and on budget delivery? So looking at um, large private sector um, versus um, public sector projects. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I'm actually working on a paper right now uh, about uh, the difference between public and private IT projects. So specifically for IT projects, we are very interested in IT at the moment. And, uh, and this is one of our big studies in IT. Um, so far, the, the result indicates that the private projects are indeed performing better than uh, public projects. But this is not what I would take away as the main message. The main message is that both are performing bad. It's really important, you know, to realize that uh, both public uh, sector projects and private sector projects are underperforming. However, it looks like uh, public sector projects are underperforming somewhat more than private sector projects. But to take that as the main message, I would say that's the secondary message. The primary message is that, that uh, both types of projects are underperforming. Second question was, what are the reasons for that? Uh, we actually don't know, and nobody knows. Nobody has studied this in, uh, in, uh, in, at a level where you, in scholarly terms, can say that we now know what the reasons are uh, for this difference. We can speculate. I mean, in a way, if you go back to neoclassical economic theory, it's already there, uh, where, you know, it's, the public sector is there to, to do projects that the private sector will not do because they are too risky, you know, or there's not enough uh, profit in them, but they still need to be done for society. So maybe, maybe the public sector is taking on uh, such projects and maybe such projects are more difficult and more complex and, and more risky than the private sector projects. And that alone would, exp would explain this, but this is theory, but it's, it's a very, I mean, very central economic theory that you'll, that you will find in economics 101, you know, if you study economics. 
uh, uh, but I, I haven't seen any study of projects that actually document that that theory, you know, without reasonable doubt documents that, that this is the theory that explains the difference. And I don't know that uh, I don't know studies that have this theory or any other theory that explains it. So I think that's the state of the art regarding reasons. Uh, but we are we are doing research on this, and we are going to be studying more project types uh, for this difference, uh, including uh, transport infrastructure. Third question was, uh, what are the best and what are the worst projects? So there's a, there's a, there's there's a table as an appendix in the in the book where you can see this, and uh, and you will see that the worst performing projects are. Uh, the stories of nuclear waste is the worst performing project. The Olympic Games, and I understand that Brisbane uh, has decided to host the Olympic Games. I'm saying good luck. Look at the <laughs> book, read about uh, how the Olympics are performing, and then figure out how you can do it differently uh, and show the world that the Olympics can be delivered on budget. On time is not a problem for the Olympics, obviously, because you don't get to mess with the opening dates. But on budget is a real problem. Actually, we have data going back to 1960. Not a single Olympics has been on budget. So Brisbane has a huge opportunity here. And I'm encouraging Brisbane, take this opportunity, become world famous by being the first city that actually delivers the, the Olympics on budget. And I promise you, you'll be in my next book if you do that. Well, I am Nuclear from power. Brisbane and we have people from Brisbane yeah. on the call. So. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we can have a little fun, a little bit of fun with this question. Nuclear power is bad, IT is bad, I already mentioned that, hydroelectric dams. So this is the very bad end of the project uh, of, uh, of performance. Uh, these are the worst performing projects. At the other end, you have the best performing project are actually solar farms. So solar farms, because they are the most repetitive project, if you think about it, it's a, it's a solar cell put on a panel, and you put the panels in an array, you have many arrays, you have a farm, a solar farm. And, uh, and solar farms are the best performing type of mega project. You can build, you can build a billion dollar uh, solar farm really fast, really easy, and uh, you can keep it on, on budget. Next uh, best performing is uh, wind power. And uh, third best performing is conventional power plants, so oil and, 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 and gas and, and coal. And uh, then energy transmission uh, is also uh, very well performing. And uh, those, are, uh, those are the four top performers at the good end of the curve. And then you, we have like 20 projects in between, you know, that are, that are like rail projects and, and skyscrapers and so on uh, that are in, on the middle ground. And the middle ground is still, you know, like buildings have a 60% cost overrun on average. That's the middle ground. And when we talk about the others, we are talking about very, very high uh, cost overruns. So let me let me then ask you about an, another kind of mega project, because we've also had a very um, interesting question around something that's quite current in Australia. Um, you, you, you might or might not know that Australia has committed $368 billion um, to the AUX nuclear submarine project with the US and the UK. Yeah. We're aiming to deliver eight submarines by mid 2050. What advice would you would you give to land this on time and on budget? Well, defense is actually one of the bad sectors. Also, uh, it's not quite as bad as the Olympics, but it's pretty bad. Uh, so again, I would say, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, basically, you need to follow the principles in the book uh, if you want to be able to succeed with something like that. And like I said, defense projects are notoriously underperforming. Uh, there's something about defense and the defense industry that, uh, you know, they have a bunch of bad habits, let's put it that way, and they keep being allowed to reproduce the bad habits, maybe in a sense because they are more protected than others, other parts of, uh, you know, project delivery. That it's uh, it's government and it's uh, it's 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 very high priority and many products are one off or you only do a few of them and so on so they may be a bit of a different type of animal in my mind that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to deliver them in an efficient manner um 
before we we get to to kind of our final questions, I do want to bring up a, a few issues that seem to transpire through some of the questions that that we have, which is um, lessons for kind of startups and 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 innovators or or um, people who have very unique projects where this idea of of experience or having repeated something that you've done before does it might might not quite um, uh, be as useful. So how, how can we think about startups and, and innovators and also about breaking kind of no. new with projects? Yep, no, but, but this is exactly what startups do, you know, that they do minimum viable products, right? And then they, they just ship it and then they see what happens and then they do it again, they ship it and see what happens, they do it again. So this is repetition. And we, we also cover this in the book. So we actually don't see any difference between the way you do a small startup and the way you successfully and the way you do a big project successfully. The main difference is that you have to be extremely careful if you are doing something uh, that is not reversible or that is unsafe somehow. So obviously you can, you could not build the Empire State Building as a minimum viable product and then say, you know, if we don't like it, we just take it down again and build another one. That doesn't work for some projects. So that's an irreversible decision. So that needs to be treated differently from something that's reversible. So reversible decisions, it's very easy to experiment with and actually do the replication and, 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 and don't worry too much about uh, how good your product is uh, because you can always uh, reverse the decision. One exception is if you're doing something that has uh, uh, safety issues. So for instance, if you're doing something in the, pharm in the pharma sector, it's different from software. Software is, is quite forgiving. You know, you can you can make lots of mistakes in software and unless it's on a plane or a rocket or something, it doesn't necessarily have to uh, have uh, uh, bad consequences. If you're doing a medicine, you can't experiment like that. You can't just ship the medicine, see how it does. And then if, it, if people die, then you just make a better version of the medicine. Yeah, but, you know? yeah. It's no good. This is actually what Theranos, I don't know if you know this company in Silicon Valley that uh, developed, a plot, uh, developed a blood testing device. And the founder, Elizabeth Holmes, has now been sentenced to 11 years in jail because she used this kind of model and, 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 and uh, it just ran away for her. I mean, she ended up doing fraud uh, to cover uh, over things because she had actually started to, she shipped too early. Basically, yeah. so and she had bad, to. Bad blood is a great book that explains. Uh, yeah, the... exactly. It's the a great factor. book. Bad blood. Bad blood. The book is. It's right here on the shelf behind me. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, so that's not a good idea to use that model in something like that. If you're doing something that is related to medicine and and uh, and and health, or something that is related to safety, where safety is a real issue. But other than that, you know, you can you can do it. I want to make sure we, we get a few more audience questions uh, um, in there. So we, we've got uh, we've got a couple of interesting questions. One is from um, Christopher Standen from uh, UNSW across the, the other road. And he wants to know how we can prioritize um, transport infrastructure investment to optimize for social outcomes, for things like um, climate or safety or less sprawl and not individual benefits like increased speed, for instance. Well, that's easy. You just decide to do it, and that's what you focus on. So you, instead of emphasizing traditional cost-benefit analysis, you emphasize a social impact analysis or an environmental in impact analysis, and and that's actually happening more and more. It's been very slow going, you know, for for social and environmental concerns to get a, a preeminent position in projects. In my view, uh, I mean, this is something people started talking about at least forty years ago. And uh, it's still it's still lagging in my view, but it's happening more now than it has ever before. So I think that that there's a good chance that that these types of concerns will have a, a stronger position uh, going forward. But it's still way too weak in my uh, in my view. But that's not because we don't know how to do it. That's because people don't want to do it. Have you got particular um, areas or regions of the world or um, um, spots that do it uh, better than, than others where there might be a, an ecosystem or, or kind of cultural um, influences that make it um, more prominent? So when you say it's, what is it's here? That made uh, better, success, you know? projects that, that prioritize social outcomes. So any project Socially. been particularly good at, at uh, prioritizing climate or, or, or safety or less urban sprawl 
um, rather but than... But you'll just have to go to the most socially advanced nations. So that would be the Netherlands, that would be Denmark, where I'm from. Uh, Sweden, Norway uh, would be like top of the line there, but still they're not doing nearly enough. Uh, so there's no, they, they can't rest on the laurels, you know, but they're doing more than others. And you see, I mean, especially if you look at, uh, you know, the way cities are designed, you see social and environmental concern being integrated more and more, much more than they were just 10 or 20 years ago. So it's, it's moving in the right direction, I think. There's still too little and it's too late, but uh, it's better than it would if it wasn't there. And there's going to be more in the future. I have no doubt about that. So since we're talking about uh, uh, different cultures, there's another um, there's another uh, question from from our audience that um, looks at you know given the the psychology and politics are, are, are both formed within particular cultural contexts the question is whether um you've come across any cultures or nations that appear to be especially good at at managing uh mega projects that's that's a very good uh, question and the answer <laughs> is no the answer is no and it's surprising there is no geography we study more than 130 countries so we have more than 130 countries in our database and of course we have looked for years now we have looked uh, is there a country that is uh, that knows how to do this so we could learn from them and the answer the sad answer is that there is not there is no such country there are some countries and periods that have been a little better than others but again it's like what i talked about uh, before it's just that they're less worse they're less bad you know it's not that they get it. So the Netherlands, for instance, are slightly better than other nations at delivering transport infrastructure. The United States, uh, during a period when they were building large dams, they were better than other countries at building large dams. Uh, so there are uh, like nuances like that, but there's no country where we can say they've got it. They know how to do it. There are countries that used to think that they knew how to do it like Germany. Germany has had a big reckoning lately with a lot of projects going wrong, most preeminently Berlin Airport. We talked about before that many airports are not built uh, you know, successfully. And Berlin Airport is, if I ever saw one that wasn't built successfully, that's it. You know, It's like a, it's the, the poster story for, for how not to build an airport, unfortunately. And there have been several projects like that in Germany that have given them a bit of an identity crisis. So they they think that they are much worse than other countries now. And, and you know, I have to reassure you, no, you're just getting down to the level of other countries. You're, you're not just worse like than everybody them. else. Yeah, you're just like everybody else, you know. Um, uh, has, has something in particular made, was there something in particular that made Germany come, come back to the to the average level because they they did have this or at least the kind of the aura of being extremely good at managing large engineering projects construction projects it might just be regression to the mean you know that it's not there's no cause other than it's regression to the mean it's not they weren't successful for that long a period you know uh, this is like the post war period and then up to like I don't know, 15 years ago things started to go a bit wrong with some projects and then there were more and more and then Berlin Airport. And now there's the whole issue with the car industry. That's actually traumatizing for the Germans. Their, their whole engineering tradition is, uh, is uh, maybe it's too strong to say called into question because it's there, you know, and they are imminent, preeminent uh, engineers. But now there's a paradigm shift going from, uh, from uh, petrol cars to electric vehicles, right? And the question is, will they be able to actually, uh, uh, will they be able to do that? So it looks like like they, they, they are doing it now, but the verdict is still out, I think, and I think that they think. It's a bit That's of an scary. Identity, identity crisis there. Um, yeah. um, uh, I'm gonna ask a question that I, I think is on, on the minds of a, of a few people, and that has to do with, with, with Agile and going back a bit to, to IT projects and the way in which Agile is practiced more than um, the way it's, uh, you know, the, the way it's taught or, or discussed, but in the way that it's practiced, there's a lot of over-optimism there. Um, it's quite costly and that there seems to be this permanent rush to um, um, develop and, and deliver things before they are, they are tested. Um, some of it not keeping with, uh, with, with what Agile really tries, tries to achieve. So what are your thoughts on, on, on Agile? 
So we actually studied Agile uh, a little bit, just like a small study, and we want to do more. But the study that we did shows that Agile is only performing better than other products on one thing, and that is time boxing. So they are actually better at, at, at keeping their schedule than others, which is not so surprising because that's the whole point of Agile, right, is, is to time box things and then, then uh, uh, deliver within the time period that was set up. But they are not better on, on cost overruns and benefit shortfalls, uh, according to the small. It's a, I mean, to be clear, this is a preliminary study. It's not like a, a big final study. But we thought this was so interesting that we would do a small preliminary study uh, because everybody's talking about Agile. I think personally that Agile is, is a good idea uh, because it has this uh, element of replication. You're not replicating the same thing, but you are replicating nevertheless, and you are you are using what you're learning uh, uh, during a short period of time uh, or during a short cycle during the next cycle. And I think that 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 uh, that's the right kind of thinking that where you have a an accumulative process where you are uh, building experience. And in what we see and what we study is that it's only by building this experience that you can get the positive learning curves, which are crucial. I, I would actually say any project that doesn't have positive learning curves, don't do it, walk away from it, don't touch it, it's not worth it. And that's whether you are working on a product team or whether you are, let's say a government or a big corporation that are doing project, you just don't wanna do those projects because they are going to drain your resources and not be very successful. Make sure they are positive learning curves. Only if a project has positive learning curves, do it. I'm very conscious of time. So maybe a, a, a last question from the audience before we, we have a few, um, a few final comments, but um, it, it takes us back to the very beginning of our conversation and that is the Sydney Opera House. And Matt in the audience asked about um, projects like, like the Opera House that might have been a, a disaster in the short term, uh, but, but went on to really change the environment in which they lived. They became lighthouse projects. How, how do we account for for, for this success or this value of, of something when, when we think about mega projects? So this, this actually happens. I mean, and I'm very happy that it happens and I'm very happy that it happened with the Sydney Opera House. Just imagine that, that the, <laughs> the whole uh, story after it was completed was as bad as the story before it was completed. You know, that would be like unbearable. I mean, if you didn't have the benefits and, and clearly, even though, I mean, the cost overrun on the Sydney Opera House was mind blowing, much larger than the Olympics, 1,400%, right? And there was a 10 year delay uh, on, the, on the project. So, so very bad, but those big costs, it doesn't matter. The, 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 clearly the Sydney Opera House has made much more money for Sydney and for New South Wales and for Australia uh than than it costs to build it it's it's a treasure also in that uh, in 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 that sense um so there are products like that we have other examples like that in the book actually that uh, that uh, you know it was a bit of a hit or miss at the outset but it actually turned out that it, it became a real success and there's no question that the benefits after uh, justify the cost up front in the sydney opera house i have the problem that my my fellow country person and fellow colleague at the university I used to work at in Denmark, Aalborg University, where he was a, a professor also. Uh, his career was destroyed and he had to be a professor instead of an architect, you know, that were actually out there building buildings. And he was even a teaching assistant in Hawaii for years, you know, because he could not get a job after he was fired from the Sydney Opera House. It is not okay. That's all I'm saying. And I'm, I know this is not going to be a popular message in Australia and in Sydney, but <laughs> hey, there you have it. We can always learn to do to do better. Um, I, I have to, be, be, before we go to closing remarks, I have to remind people that um, they can get uh, How Big Things Get Done, which is uh, your, your latest book online and with Glee Books, who is um, also a partner for, for our event. Um, and I have to thank everyone who submitted questions. There are so, so many more than, uh, than we managed to get to. Um, but if you've enjoyed this conversation around the way we think about big projects, you might... Uh, 
um, about changing your mind about how you think about big projects or previously um, about thinking with, with Danny Kahneman, you might um, uh, be interested in our um, Unlearn project, which is our new podcast series about changing your mind and about changing common sense. You know, why robots are coming to make your job harder or what music is for or why small is the new big. Um, and you can subscribe to the online projects wherever you get your good podcasts. But Ben's provided us some fantastic insights into managing big projects, including what factors that make them work and make them successful, you know, choosing um, experience, choosing the right theme, thinking slow and act, acting fast. Um, so much more insights in the book, including, you know, 11 heuristics for how to do better project leadership. So I, I really do recommend you, you, you grab a copy. Bent, it's been such a pleasure to have you. I hope the next one we do is, is in person. We said that to Danny a few times, but uh, COVID happened and all things happened, but we hope the next yeah. one is um, is in Sydney, and I'd be remiss not to give a very big thank you to the Sydney Business Insights team and the broader University of Sydney team, and especially Pat Norman, who is also one of your biggest fan fans. And um, thank you all for spending so much time with us today, and thank you for spending your evening with us. Um, thank you, the audience, for all the questions. My pleasure, and, and great questions, Sandra. Great, great questions from the audience also. Thank you to Sydney Insights and 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 to you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>